We're starting this brand new series called Hope Has a Name. And what we believe here at Epic is that hope is more than a feeling. Hope is more than an attitude. Hope is, is more than just being optimistic. Hope has a name, and that name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus wants to speak into your life and my life, and he wants to help us have hope in our heart. Whatever we see on the news or whatever we see in life, he wants to fill our hope, our heart with, with hope because he is hope. And what we're going to do in this series is we're going to walk through stories from the life of Jesus, and we're going to look at how he speaks hope into our lives and into our situation. And before we jump into that, I want to ask this question. Take a moment, I'll pull your phones out, look at your phones, and scroll back on your phone to the last photo that is on your phone before everything happened, before the pandemic happened, going way back in March. Scroll back on your phone and find that picture. Are you there yet? Have you found that picture yet? Scroll, I know it's way back. It was 13 weeks ago. It's a lot of pictures in there, but go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. And then, and then just share, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube, share what that is a picture of. What did you, is the last picture on your phone before all this happened? Well, let me tell you about the last picture that's on my phone before all of this happened. It was Epic Wednesday. We were gathering together here on a Wednesday night. This was all starting to happen that week. And then Thursday, we sent an email out. Friday, we canceled service. And then by the weekend, this thing was all full blown. And so the last pictures on my phone are from Epic Wednesday. And Epic Wednesdays this time, I've taught classes with Epic Wednesdays. That's where we gather together and do classes and small groups. And then we have kids ministry. And my wife, Kathy, and I said, you know what? We don't have a class this time. Everybody go to classes. We'll take the kids for the Epic Wednesday. And this is the last picture that is on my phone of Kathy teaching the kids on Epic Wednesday. And gathered together, there, there were only six kids. And, and what was interesting about that with everything that's happened in our, our world today, you know, there were two kids that are there that are they're African-American, that are black, and there are four kids that are white. And when you watch the way the kids interact together, they just interact as kids. And they played together. And we were teaching them about love, and we were teaching them about forgiveness, and where they were teaching them about Jesus. And we had a blast doing those Epic Wednesday classes. And we just enjoyed the unity and the closeness and togetherness that we had with all of those kids. But the reality is, when I look at this picture, what I see in this little room here the joy, the unity, the togetherness, the oneness these kids are going to grow up. And their experience in life is going to be dramatically different. And it doesn't have anything to do with their heart and their life, because all these kids bring joy to our lives. But it has to do with the color of their skin and the experiences that they will have in life going forward. And so we want to talk a little bit about that, because the reality is, as these kids grow older, as one sports caller called in on on the, the sports station in Detroit this week, he said, as we were talking about the issues that have been happening in the world, he said, when I trained, a grandfather called in, and when I trained my kids to drive, I explained to them how they should act when a, if a policeman pulled them over, and I explained to them, he, he was white. But his grandson is black who lives with him. And he said, you know what? I have had to explain. He's just got his license this past year. And I had to explain to him a whole other set of rules that because I, I want him to come home alive. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. Have them be seen at all times. Have, you know, react differently when those situations happen because he knows the culture and the climate of our country. And he knows how situations can go wrong. And I want my children to come home and my grandchildren to come home. And then he said this, this should not be in the United States. This should not be in the country that represents freedom in the world. Something needs to change. And we've all seen that in the last week and a half, what we've seen is those videos and pictures. And, and I don't know if you watched that, the eight minutes and 46 seconds of George Floyd being murdered on the street. 
If you watch that, it turned my stomach upside down just watching it. The anger, the hurt as I watched what was happening. It reminded me back of watching the Rodney King beating. How many years ago that was? Almost 30 years ago. And these things still happen. And then we had just a situation just a, a few months back, which it took four, 74 days for the assailants to be arrested in the Ahmad Arbery situation where he was just jogging through a neighborhood in Georgia and two guys grabbed him and murdered him on the street. And it breaks my heart. And why did it take so long for justice to be served in that case? Or Brianna Taylor was just relaxing in her home in Louisville and police, you know, busted in at a drug deal and they, they shot and murdered her. And we look at these situations and it just turns our stomach upside down. And, 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 and the reality is right now, we can't take a, have a blind eye to what's happening in the world. And the truth of the matter is this. When Jesus prayed for his church, when Jesus prayed for his world, this is what he wanted to happen, oneness. And the reality is it's not happening. Let's just look at the words of Jesus now for, for a moment. And, and I'm sorry if this message gets you a little uncomfortable. I hope it does. Because my desire as a pastor is to make us all a little bit uncomfortable and to make us look at some things that maybe we don't want to look at in life. Because we've got to see things from God's perspectives. If we're going to be a bridge, if we're going to bring change into this world, if we're going to be the church in this world, we've got to see things from God's perspective. And we've got to act in a way that reflects the love of Jesus Christ. And for many of us, we never... We, we, we're, we don't even realize where we're, not, we're missing it. Look at, this is the prayer of Jesus. Jesus is praying with his disciples in the upper room right before he's, a, he's going to go to the cross, right before he goes out to, to, to be betrayed and face death. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. He's praying for the disciples. And then look what he says. I pray also for those who will believe in me. That's you and me. Jesus took time out of his experience on planet earth that he decided to pray for us. Pray for me. Pray for you. Who's going to believe through their message? That's us. And what is his prayer? What is he praying for for us? What is the thing that he wants us to get more than anything else? That our doctrine would be right, that we would lead perfect moral lives, that we would be a good upstanding citizens? No, no. He says this, I'm going to pray that they may be one that there would be unity together, that each person would be, be equal together in the family of God. That's what he's praying for, that there would be radical unity in the church. And the reality is that's not what we always see in the church. And he says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, the unity of, of the Trinity May they also be in us when we're united together with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We experience this oneness so that what? What's the result of that? What happens when we experience that? What happens when we build it? What happens when we realize there's differences and we got to come together? What happens? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. The goal is our witness. <laughs> That's his goal. And he says, the number one thing that's going to be a witness to the world is our unity, is our oneness. And the reality is, if we're really honest, there's not a lot of that. Sometimes Sunday morning is the most racially divided place in the United States because we're separate. And Jesus didn't end there. And then he continues praying, and he almost reiterates the same thing. Next half of the prayer is this. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are in one. He's praying it again. He said, guys, get this. It's so important. I in them and you in me when Christ is in us. Oh, man. He is saying that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved them me. He is saying in a world that's pulling apart, we should be the ones that are pulling it together. We are the ones that can bring unity. I mean, 
I mean, and sometimes we say, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that, I get that. You know, it's like this in our homes. You know, sometimes you ever heard that expression, you know, mama's only as happy as the least happy kid in the house, right? You heard that expression? It's true, isn't it? Mama's only happy as the least happy kid in the house. The truth of the matter, is that is not only true in families. <laughs> that is true in community. That is true in our country. And we've got a a group of people in our country that are hurting, that are in pain, that are in agony because of what they saw, that that they know that that could be me, that those kids in our kids' ministry, that could be them as they get older. You know what? And there's hurt and there's pain and there's agony in that. And you know what? Sometimes we think we are one, but you know what? We got to look and be empathetic and sympathetic to those people that may be experiencing something different than us. And we reach into their world and try to understand them. Why? Because we want oneness in the body of Christ. When I was a missionary in Africa, it was a realization that we, we had as in the West, we always say this, I think, therefore I am. I believe, therefore I'm a member of the church. But the, when we were missionaries in Africa for two years, the mindset is communal. Think, they think communally. And, and, and it's a beautiful thing because someone in Ghana would say this, it's not I think, therefore I am. I belong, therefore I am. And maybe we need to grab a hold of that in the church. It's not I believe, therefore I am. It's I belong, therefore I am. And we need to work as a body of Christ so that every person feels that they belong, that that every person feels that they, they can together. You know, and the reality is racial reconciliation is part of the gospel. It's part of what we're called to do and be as the body of Christ, to work, to build bridges, to bring unity, to bring reconciliation, to bring peace, and to bring hope in a hurting area of our community. And that's what I'm challenging us all to do today. And here's, if you think, well, this, maybe, maybe this isn't, where I'm thinking, just, just, the Bible is so chocked full of places where it says, Racism and injustice is wrong. I mean, here's one right here, this next verse. In 2 Chronicles 19, look at what it says the Lord does not tolerate. He does not tolerate perverted justice, partiality, and the taking of bribes. We kind of get the taking of bribes, pay somebody off. You know, that's wrong. We know that's wrong. But what does this mean? Perverted justice. You know what perverted justice is? It's injustice. When justice needs to happen in a situation and it gets twisted and and so that someone doesn't experience the justice that they deserve. The reality is when you look at the word justice, it actually has the same root as the word righteousness. The fact that as Christians, we experience the righteousness of God because the justice of God went on Jesus. The sins that we needed to, which we should have paid for, Jesus paid for us. So now we experience his righteousness and now we can be reconciled as of bringing justice in the world. And we look at injustice in the world and we go, that can't be. God doesn't tolerate that. I can't tolerate that. I can't stand on the sideline when things like that happen happen. Second thing is it says, so that's injustice. No, back up one more time. Partiality, partiality. What does partiality mean? That's mean you, when you show favor to one group as opposed to someone else, that you're being partial to someone. We try in families to not be partial to one of the kids, even though the kids often feel that way, right? The truth is, you know what partiality is? Partiality is prejudice. Partiality is racism, is what it is. It's showing showing preference to one race over another. And for many, we think, oh, no, 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 that's not happening. It is happening. Open our eyes and see. And I think the world is opening our eyes. Do you realize this is the largest civil rights protest and movement that we've ever experienced on the planet Earth? Every state in the United States is reaching out and saying, you know what, injustice is wrong. Racism is wrong. This needs to change. Cities around the globe are saying that. And they're agreeing with God. God has always said that. He's always been about unity. He's always been about bringing people together. 
And sometimes, you know, we get this idea that, you know, we even say things. And I'm just going to shoot straight in the white community. We say certain things like this. We hear the words Black Lives Matter and we go, whoa, 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 whoa. When, I don't know, but they just, whoa, all lives matter. I've heard people say all lives matter. And you, the reality is... <laughs> That's assumed all lives matter. But right now, there's a black lives that are facing injustice and racism in the world. We sang the song earlier about the lost sheep, and it'd be like holding up the sign that say, lost sheep matter. And the rest of the sheep like, whoa, 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 all sheep matter, all sheep matter. The truth is, it only matters if we, if we put ourselves in that situation and see, empathize with someone else. It'd be like Jesus was saying this, you know, when Jesus said, blessed are the poor, and we went, whoa, 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 whoa. You know what? Blessed are all people, Jesus. Don't, don't just single out one group right now. He's singling them out because there's injustice going on in their situation right now. And the truth is, in the black community, there is injustice that is going on. There is racism that happens in the world. It is real. We all know it. And I think Jesus is working to bring it to the forefront right now. He's bringing it because equality matters. Because injustice matters. Because people matter. And when our brothers and sisters in the African-American community are struggling, it matters to us. So black lives do matter. They definitely matter. They matter to us in the body of Christ. They matter to us in the country. And this is the time where we got to see it. And I know some of you probably just flipping off right now and say, you know what, I got something better to watch this morning. But I encourage you, press in a little bit. And listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying to you. I mean, because the truth is, next thought is this, is that God hates racism and injustice. He hates it. You see it throughout Scripture. I mean, I had two hours worth of stuff. I was going to hide so many verses when I was preparing yesterday, and I had to trim it back. And there's so much in there. And when racism, let's just unpack those a little bit more, and let's just let... Get reflective a little bit. We got to get reflective. We're, we're so much in life, we, we end up getting defensive. We end up just clicking on things online instead of getting reflective. We don't get reflective and look at our heart and our life. We're missing it. I'm doing it in my own life, just getting reflective. Here, here's, here's the truth of the matter is racism is this. Racism, next slide. Racism questions God's creation. It questions God's creation. Because who, you know whose idea it was for race? It was God's idea. He thought it would be an awesome idea that everybody looked different, that everybody would be uniquely different, that there would be races, that there would be differences, that there would be different cultures. He had this incredible idea to do all of that. And he celebrated that because God loves variety. Just look at the plants that he created, everything that God does. He's into variety. He's into diversity. He created different races and different cultures. His idea was to create those incredible differences that we have. And here's the truth about it. Next slide here. Then the truth is this. God made differences to be, made us different to be celebrated, and then people used it to be separated. God created diversity so that we would celebrate it. He created us different so that we would celebrate it. But what happens is we separated, we segregated, and we dominated. And Jesus is saying, I want to see if you'll lay down your differences for oneness. If you'll lay down your self-centeredness to see where someone else is struggling for oneness, for unity, for togetherness. If you let someone else's pain enter into your heart so that you experience it. And I know sometimes when I say things like this, people always say things like, well, you know what? You know, I don't see color. I don't see that at all. God doesn't see color. I'm just colorblind. You, you want to know when you say something like that, you're doing a disservice to God because he made us different. 
He wants us to see the differences. And he wants us to see the experiences that are different. He wants us to see that, you know what, someone in the UP, their experience growing up as a white person is very different than someone's experience that grew up maybe in a city that was African American. To see those differences and enter into those worlds and go, let me see your struggle. Let me see your pain. Let me see where, where let me hear your story. And bring unity together. God doesn't want us to be colorblind. He wants us to be color blessed. He made it that way so that we could celebrate the differences. And the only way that happens in our life is when we get reflective. When we begin to look at ourselves and go, okay, God, where am I missing it? Where is my sin getting in the way of being together? Where is it? What do I need to do? And you know what? Story after story of the Bible of people having those moments where they're seeing it. Did you realize that Peter had a moment like that where he had to lay his racism aside in order to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you realize that? Peter, the guy that Jesus said, you're going to be rocky. You're going to be the one that I'm going to build my church on. Guess what? He grew up in a world where there were two. There was Jews and there was Gentiles. And there were two. And he grew up in a world that said, you know what? You over there, you keep separate from that group over there. You don't mix with the different races. You stay there, you stay there. And so he grew up in that world. And the truth is, as you look at that scripturally, Every single one of us is a Gentile. Whether you grew up in, uh, you were, have a heritage in Africa or Asia or South America or Europe, wherever it is, we're all Gentiles. And the, Peter needed to reach out to this world he had never been part of. It was a different world than him. He was raised in this little Jewish community, and now he's, God said, go into the world. But God had to do a work in his heart to get over some of the racism that he had in order to reach that group of people. And what happens is God gives him a dream where he says, nothing is unclean, no one is unworthy, the gospel is for everyone. And what's fascinating, he has this dream, this revelation from God. And then a guy named Cornelius knocks at his door next morning. Hey, hey, I heard about this Jesus. I want to talk about this Jesus. And guess who Cornelius was? He was a Roman centurion. Jesus like, the Peter's like, whoa, you're the guy that just killed Jesus. And it's a you're different kind of person. Look at what it says. This is an Acts. This is him getting it. Peter addressed them and he says, you know, I'm sure that this is highly irregular. Jews just don't do this. Visit and relax with people of another race. This is going on in the country at the time. But God has just shown me that no race is better than any other. It's a revelation that's going on in the life of Peter. He's getting it. He's going, oh, the gospel is for everyone. There's unity. There's togetherness. We got to enter into another person's world with the hope of Jesus. And I have to see them as a brother and sister in Christ. And I got to be a bridge to that person. I got to see people like Jesus sees them. And then look what happens next in life of Peter. The next thing he says down in verse 34. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favor to him, but he accepts from every nation. You know what my prayer is for every single one of you tuning in? Is this. That you'd have a moment with Jesus like Peter had with Jesus. That now I realize. Now my eyes are open. Now I'm looking at these things different. If you're struggling right now and all you see are the riots, realize there's 95% of what's going on is just peaceful protesting of the injustice and the racism that exists. Maybe you just look for that and begin to see that now I realize. My prayer is that you'd have a now I realize moment with Jesus because Jesus is the one that can transform our hearts. Jesus is the one that can build a bridge in our lives. Now I realize. And that realization opened the door for Peter to take the gospel across the Mediterranean. And to Rome, where he reached out to people that actually put Jesus to death with the hope of Jesus. And he said, hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. <sighs> Next thought about injustice is this one. 
Whew. Injustice breaks the great commandment. This is why it's so important. Injustice breaks the, the great commandment. Here's the story here. In the, in this is a story from the life of Jesus that's so important. If we want to grab a hold of it, Jesus was, was there was a man that showed up and started talking to Jesus and he said, what is, what is the whole gospel all about, Jesus? What is your mission? What are you trying to say? How do I get to heaven? What's the goal? And he said, here it is. The great commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, you know, and all your strength and with all your mind. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor. That's what it's all about. That's an incredible thing. That's what we want to be about. But then look what the man said next. Oh, man, because this is what we do. Instead of being like Mr. Rogers and saying, won't you be my neighbor? I want to be neighborly. I want to share the love of Jesus with you. He, he said, I want to expand my neighbor circle. He said, I want to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, well, so who is my neighbor? Who do I have to do this for? I don't know if I really want to do this. I, I, what, who is my neighbor? He was pulling his circle back, his partiality, his racism, pulling his circle back. And then Jesus says the story that many of us know, the story of the Good Samaritan. And here's what happens. He says, here's the story. He, he replied, Jesus replies with a story, and I love this. And this is what it was great about Jesus. He always replies with a story that prompts you to think, that prompts you to reflect. He doesn't respond with his opinion. He just says, here's a story. Reflect a little bit. Let the Holy Spirit work in your heart and your life. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Could be happening today. Okay. And then what happens next is this is happening. A guy's beaten on the street. And then it goes on and he says, this is a horrible injustice. And we have an opportunity to help. Next slide is this. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed by. He said, oh, maybe he deserved that. Maybe he was a criminal. Maybe it wasn't a good, I don't want to get involved with this. I'm not really sure I should. You know what? I, 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 it's not my problem. Not my issue. Then a temple assistant walked by and looked at him lying there, and he also passed by on the other side of the road. He said, maybe if I just click on to something else, flip the channel, I can just ignore this. Then a despised Samaritan, they were the outsiders, came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, he felt compassion for him. This is huge. You know what Martin Luther King said about this verse right here? He said this. The first question the priest and the Levite asked, if I stop and help this man, what will happen to me? But the good Samaritan reversed the question. He said, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? He's a brother. He's a sister in Christ. He's an outsider. But I want to reach across the lines. I want to be a bridge. And he's, what will happen if I don't do anything? And he said, I have compassion for him. So I, we went over to him, and the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey, and he put him in an inn where he took care of him. He reacted with compassion. I think God's growing our compassion quotient here. I think we're seeing with new eyes, with compassionate eyes, that equality matters. And we don't want to see that, and we got to work to end that. And then Jesus gives this challenge at the end, which is the challenge for us. He says this. Now, which one of these three would you say was the neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Notice Jesus doesn't just give him his opinion. He just makes him think, which is great technique as we just learn to have dialogues. Jesus asked, the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Yes. And here's our challenge. Now go and do the same. Now go and do the same. The truth for you and I is this when we look at this verse. Just because someone is not in your neighborhood, next slide, not in your neighborhood, doesn't mean they are not your neighbor. 
We got to expand like Mr. Rogers and say, hey, these people out there, they, they, they're struggling. They're my neighbor. How can I reach out to them? How can I help them? How can I be like the good Samaritan and help them? And here's three simple ways that you guys can do this. Simple ways that you can be a bridge to someone else who's maybe different. And this includes all of us out there of all races. We look to reach out to someone who's different. We look to reach out to build a bridge to someone else. Is to listen to someone else's story. Listen to someone else's pain. Your pain is not like my pain. My pain is not like your pain. And just to hear, and for all too long, there's been a segment of the population that has felt unlistened to. And we get the opportunity to listen and step into their world and listen to someone who might be different than you. So start listening. Uh, listening uncovers people's feelings. It's not a just enough to just think you understand the other person. The goal is that the other person should feel understood by you. So listen. Then learn. Learn something new. Learn a new experience. Step in. We are so separated that we don't know someone else's experience. Learn that experience. When I look at the young people today... Man, they're, they're learning and they're acknowledging and they're, they're stepping in, in empathetic ways to learn someone else's experience. And then they act on someone else's behalf. It's not enough to just say, I feel compassion in my heart. You got to do something. Look what the Good Samaritan did. He did something. He went over to him and he soothed his wounds and he bandaged them. And he put the man on his own donkey. He said, I'm going to invest. I'm going to use my own resources. And he took him to an inn and he took care of him. That brings unity. We have that kind of heart of compassion that moves. <sighs> That's what Jesus wants so desperately bad. And the truth is, I may not understand everything that's going on in someone else's world. But you know what? When we gather in the church, we have someone that understands injustice and racism and hurt and pain, and his name is Jesus Christ. Because the truth of the matter is, you know, and I watched that video of George Floyd this week, you know, last week. It took me back to when I watched The Passion of the Christ and Jesus was getting whipped in that movie. And I was like... Where's your mercy? Just stop. Just stop. Just stop. And I was saying the same thing as I was watching that. Just stop. Just stop. Does any of you see this? You know, and the truth is we worship a Savior who was stripped, who was mocked. If you want to talk about, you know, the injustice in the African-American community, Jesus understands Everything that went on. He understands what it's like to be paraded around. He understands what it's like to be hung on a tree, to be tortured. He understands what it's like to be wrongly accused on trumped up charges and sentenced unjustly and murdered on the street while no one came to his aid. I guess the only person that came to him as aid was another criminal. And he said, we are punished justly, getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus went through all of that injustice on the cross to pay for your sins, to pay for my sins. And since he paid them all, he's the one place that we can look to for hope in this. Because if he paid my sins and he paid your sins and he knows injustice and he knows hurt and pain, he can bring hope and justice to the world. Let's just take a moment now, all of us in our homes, and uh, let's just pray, because prayer, God can work. And so I don't know what you're going to do. I'm just going to kneel right here, and I'm just going to kneel down. And maybe you want to just kneel down on your floor. Maybe you want to kneel down and cuddle together as a family, because this affects all of us, regardless of the race, your background, God's prayer is that we would be one. And he was praying for you and I. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, we come before you as people that we so often like 
the priest and the temple worker, God, we just walk to the other side and we ignore what's going on or we excuse what's going on or we, 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 we don't get involved. And God, you, you have called us to a calling of reaching across the aisle, to reaching to bring your hope, to bring your grace, to bring your love, to bring your forgiveness to the world, to bring the oneness that you want in the church, to bring the oneness that you want in our country, to bring the oneness. And as a church, we should be the ones leading this in the world. And so often the church has failed. So often the church has failed. So often I have failed to be a bridge to someone else. But Lord, today's a new day. And, and we come before you confessing, God, that we have fallen short. All of us have sinned in our heart. All of us have stood beside, by when injustice happened, when racism happened. But God, we want to be like the Samaritan that said, you know what? I want to learn. I want to listen. I want to act. I want to step out now from this day going forward. I want to live a different life of compassionate passion. I want to have an experience like Peter that transforms my life. And Jesus, only you can transform my heart. Only you can transform this world. Only you. Because you understand fully what it's like to be hanging on, the tr on a tree. And you went through all of that to redeem us. And because we matter to you, Jesus, people that are in pain and the people that are in hurt matter to us too. And so, Jesus, we come before you now and we confess and we lift our hearts open to you. And God, we ask that you would use us to be a bridge to someone else this week that this would be a beginning of a new change in every single one of our lives. That we would be people that reflect your love, not our opinions. That we'd be people that bring hope that's found only in you. That's our prayer. God, you have hope in us. You believe that prayer could actually come true. And maybe this is the generation that will actually make that prayer a reality in the world. That's our prayer. Make us one as you and the Father are one. In your name, amen. When Jesus prayed that prayer that they would be one, he wasn't just crossing his fingers hoping that it would happen. He believed it would happen. He desired it to happen. He's empowering every single one of us to, to make that happen to be that good Samaritan. He's empowering you today to be that good Samaritan, to be the one that will build a bridge to reach out to someone else. I don't know if we found that picture yet, but there was a picture from the week before on uh, at Epic Kids on, on Epic Wednesdays. And it's so true. This is where our hope is found. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. And it says here, what Eddie's pointing to, is the Lord, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Take that grace of Jesus Christ. He has forgiven you. He has redeemed you. He has wiped the slate clean. And now he says, go out and be that person to bring that forgiveness, to bring that grace to bring that hope to someone, maybe even someone that's different than you this week. Have an amazing week. We're going to continue this series next week where we're going to look at Jesus turning water into wine and I encourage you to tune in next week. It's going to be good as we look through the stories of Jesus and as we watch the way the stories of Jesus transform our heart and our life. Have an amazing week and we'll see you next Sunday.